and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, journalist Helen Fospero. This week, I'm out in the countryside at a beautiful farm in West Sussex to meet former British film producer and passionate wildlife photographer George Duffield, a marine conservationist and co-founder of Blue Marine Foundation. George is perhaps best known in film circles for his powerful, award-winning 2009 documentary, The End of the Line, about one of the world's most disturbing environmental problems, overfishing. Fifteen years on, our oceans remain in crisis. Overfishing impacts the ocean's biodiversity and ability to store carbon, therefore affecting its vital function of stabilising the Earth's climate. Blue Marine is dedicated to restoring the ocean's health by addressing overfishing and has partnered with Convex for the Seascape Survey, a major five-year scientific initiative with Convex and scientists at Exeter University to produce robust and conclusive data to determine how the ocean can be an ally and key player in our climate crisis and how we can restore the seabed's ability to act as a giant carbon sink. George, thank you so much for inviting me down to the farm. The sunshine is out. This is a really beautiful spot, isn't it? And it's close to the sea as well, which is why I love it. It's close to the sea. You see, where did your passion for the ocean and your desire to protect it come from? I have always been a diver. So I I think it's being underwater a lot. And I've had a great privilege of being able to travel and see extraordinary creatures under the ocean, ranging from sharks in the Galapagos to leopard seals in the Antarctic. And along the way, I, I fell in love with them. And so I sort of dedicated my life to trying to save them. And in fact, I was in Tonga diving with two wonderful artists called Ollie and Susie, who are really extraordinary people. And they paint underwater they paint these animals underwater and then bring the pictures up. And so my job was to take the photos. And there we were diving with humpback whales. And I read a book on that trip called The End of the Line. And this book said, written by Charles Clover, it said, if we keep fishing as we're fishing, there will be no more fish. And that absolutely shocked me because like, I think everyone, you think the sea is an inexhaustible supply of food and it's a huge resource. How could it possibly be affected by man? And the answer is it can be, and it will be. And so I came out of that trip saying, I have to make this film. I called Charles and he said, well, sadly, I've just licensed the the rights to a a producer called Claire Lewis. And I was like, Claire Lewis? (laughs) I was quite good friends with her daughter. So I called up Claire and we made the film together. And it was a tremendous success in as much as any film about fish can be a success. And everybody watched it. And we took it all around the world and we screened it at the UN and in the Senate and to the parliaments and to Prince Charles, now King Charles, and all sorts of people engaged and said, what do we do? What do we do? This is an extraordinary problem that we didn't know about. And so we said, okay, well, let's let's figure this out. And we looked at other NGOs and no one was paying attention to overfishing at all. Yes, WWF had some fisheries improvement programs and you know some of the big guys were doing a little bit of work, but nobody was really focused on overfishing. So uh, kind of against our wishes, we started Blue Marine Foundation. And I do advise people not to start charities because it can take over your life and it is far more work than anyone realizes. And of course, you have to keep feeding them. You know, you can never stop. You start a charity, you have to keep going. So we started Blue and immediately had a tremendous success. We enabled the creation of the largest no-take marine protected area on the planet around Chagos, which is the British Indian Ocean Territories. And we've done an incredible thing there and protected the ocean. And whether or not the Chagossians get the right to go back there, it's a healthy, vibrant sea that they will get back. And from there, it's off to the races. And we've done amazing things. Wow, that's an incredible opener there. Just going back to the overfishing, is the most shocking thing that overfishing does is stripping the ocean of life and reducing its capacity to produce oxygen and absorb carbon dioxide and help and be a key player in regulating our climate? I mean, in essence, yes. What people don't understand or didn't understand until quite recently is that the ocean is actually a living creature. It's not just sea. It's the web of life within it that actually causes the ocean to function as the lungs of the planet. So it absorbs 30% of the carbon dioxide. It gives off half of the oxygen. So every other breath you take comes from the sea. It has historically absorbed 90% of the heat generated by humanity since the Industrial Revolution. So if we didn't have the ocean, we would already be in critical global heating. 
But it's the animals in it that circulate the carbon, that capture the carbon, that are then consumed by bigger animals that then die, that fall to the seabed, that become mud. It's that process of the carbon cycle that allows the ocean to function. And if we strip it out, if we kill all the fish, you get these algal blooms, you get these dead zones, you get the system breaking down. And then it doesn't function as the lungs of the planet. And this is why overfishing is the world's biggest solvable problem. We can fix it very easily. And if we do, then we can literally save the planet. What kind of appetite are you getting around the world from people who are responsible for the overfishing? It's very difficult, isn't it, when there's, there's money involved. And I would imagine in certain quarters, greed yeah. And and people have done things a certain way. For sure. And they make a lot of money from well, from that fishing. Yes. How do you begin? This is probably why you said at the beginning, don't start a charity, because where do you start to try and make a difference? Well, in the beginning, very few people were listening. And it's still a, a vanishingly small amount of charitable giving goes to the oceans. I mean, there, there's a statistic that may be out of date that less than 4% of charitable giving worldwide goes to the environment. So that's the environment. Within that 4%, less than 4% goes to the ocean. So here we have something that covers 72% of the surface of the earth, 95% of the habitable space on the planet, and it gets 4% of 4% of charitable giving. So that's not clearly, much, is it? it's not enough. But the good news about marine conservation is it's such an extraordinary win win that when people start to understand it, you can really achieve very large scale results very quickly. Marine conservation done right allows more fishing. It's only the worst kind of fishers who don't comprehend that if you fish sensibly, you actually get more fish. Now we've proved this at Blue. We've created what is the gold standard for small scale fisheries, which is in Lime Bay in Dorset, where essentially in return for getting access to market with a sustainable brand and receiving support for an ice machine, which by the way is an ice machine, big enough to fill 40 boats a day with ice. So it's not your home gin and tonic ice machine. <laughs> it's an industrial ice factory. In return for accessing that, they agreed to fish sustainably. But and that means changing the way they, they operate in the sea, not trawling anything, changing the size of the nets so the babies can get out, changing some areas is completely set aside, some areas for exploitation of only fixed pots, just changing the system. They are now earning more money catching less fish in a more productive sea than ever before. So there's this scenario where it's easier to catch the fish because there are more of them. The fish are more valuable because they're from a sustainable spot and retailers respect that. And you're spending less money going out there to get them and you're win, win, win and everybody gains. So there's more biodiversity, more money, more income, more fish. So this is why marine conservation done right isn't negative to anybody. The problem with the land is if you're planting forests, you're essentially saying to people, well, you can't farm here or you can't expand your village here. If you're saving orangutans, you're saying you can't chop down these trees and earn a living here. You have to just leave this area alone. So there's always somebody in opposition to what you're trying to do on land. But in the sea, done right, there's nobody in opposition to more fish managed properly. That's really exciting, isn't it? The sea, to me, looks like it is packed full of opportunity and blue economy, I suppose. Am I using that phrase correctly? There's opportunities, aren't there, for people to do well and people to do better and the sea to thrive. Well, so the blue economy is then the next stage. So Blue Marine is a charity, but one of the things we've established over the last decade at Blue is that there are huge livelihoods at stake here in the ocean and giant industries functioning often quite badly in the sea. And the blue economy as a whole is worth two and a half trillion dollars a year which is equivalent to the seventh largest country on earth, right? It has no representative at the UN. It isn't a thing, but it's still this enormous economic powerhouse. Is it the economy that's driven by our oceans? Is that what the blue economy is, if you like? The blue economy is anything that profits from or utilizes the sea. So it fundamentally splits down into fisheries and aquaculture, which is the bit that I'm most focused on, but also transport counts as blue economy, and to a certain extent, tourism as well. But I think for the purposes of our work and for the purposes of regenerating ocean health, the most critical piece is the fisheries and aquaculture piece. And here you have incredible numbers of really quite unconsolidated, poorly optimized, environmentally often negative businesses going about 
taking as much as they can because of the tragedy of the commons, which is, you know, everybody's entitled to this. So why would you respect it properly? And on top of which, you've got poor quotas set by governments that are routinely ignored by fishermen. So you've got this setup where everybody's exploiting it as rapidly as possible, but there's a cliff coming. And so, you know, it's our inside at Blue is, is to work with fishermen to manage the seas for the next generation rather than just their generation. And the Blue economy is all about investing in the ocean now to do those businesses correctly so that they can continue to grow. Because if we don't grow the blue economy, people are going to start. Hundreds of millions of people a day depend on seafood as protein. So if we destroy the fish in it, and A, those livelihoods disappear, but B, they literally starve. We were saying right at the beginning, just before we started recording, you were saying that the fate of humanity is at stake. It is, isn't it? So blue carbon has been neglected and ignored and misunderstood and basically forgotten in the calculations for global warming. And the reason why it's getting so much interest now is because people have suddenly realized that they've essentially left off the balance sheet a third of the world's carbon. So there is a way to do this and to manage the ocean for carbon as opposed to for maximum economic gain, right? So we manage the ocean for carbon that allows us to really have a chance against runaway global warming. And the beauty of marine conservation is that when you manage it for carbon, you're also managing it for ecosystem restoration. So you're going to get a healthier sea and you're going to get more fishing. You just have to change the way you fish. And this is where the convex seascape survey comes in, which is we really don't know how much carbon is stored on the bottom of the ocean. And we really don't know what the processes humanity is doing to that seabed, what impact that has. So the convex seascape survey is going to figure out how much carbon is stored on a healthy seabed versus how much is stored on an unhealthy or damaged or heavily used seabed. We don't know. And the probability, I hope, is that it proves that when you leave the sea alone, when you look after it, the sea forests grow back and the fish come back and the seals come back and the marine flora, everything comes back. On the off chance, we discover that that's not the case and the science comes back negative. That's fine. Then we move on and look for other ways to save the planet. But I'm reasonably confident that the seascape survey is going to show that a healthy seabed captures a lot more carbon than an unhealthy seabed. And that is going to change the world because for the first time in history, we can take that and we can turn marine protection into a carbon credit, which means that we can monetize marine protection. So instead of me begging for money to close areas for fishing, which is what I do at Blue, countries are going to be able to throw out the industrial boats that have come in or exploiting their resources and sell credits from protected areas and still allow their little artisanal fishermen to go out and fish. Because that's fine. As long as you don't touch the seabed, you can take a small amount of fish out of the water column. Nobody minds that. And so we're going to transform 10,000 years of taking things out of the sea, which is the only way you get money out of the sea historically, into you're paid to leave it alone. And it's going to change the world. That's amazing. And I know that you were a driving force with Stephen Catlin from Convex and also the marine biologist like Professor Callum Roberts at Exeter University. What kind of things will you be doing on the practical front to gather this robust research that you'll be collecting? Well, first of all, can I just say about Stephen, I don't know anybody on earth who's actually done more in a more sort of modest and discreet way than Stephen. I mean, the three things he's done are each kind of legacy breaking models. I mean, to have done the Catlin Arctic Ice Survey, which basically uncovered the fact that the Arctic poles were melting due to global warming. And then to do this, the Coral Sea View, which has sort of set down a benchmark for how we track corals and their health across the planet. And now to be doing this, you know, these are three epoch making science projects. And, and Stephen's just done this for almost no glory. And I, I just think it's unbelievable. I, if Jeff Bezos was doing this, it'd be in every paper everywhere. So I think Stephen deserves a lot more respect for this than perhaps he gets on a regular basis. Your question is about the science and what are we going to do for the convex Practically, seascape? what will you be doing? Will boats be going? Well, you should have asked Callum when you had Callum. He's a scientist. I did ask him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the answer is we're gathering a lot of mud. <laughs> gathering a lot of mud. Because it's all about the mud. I mean, the seabed is mud. It's not that glamorous and we have a challenge at Blue because our job is the education and outreach and the communication package around this, as well as managing the whole program. But communicating the importance of mud is what we're trying to do here because it, what we're theorizing is that if you trawl the mud with a boat for fish and for sea life on the seabed, 
you remineralize the carbon into the water column and then it either escapes into the atmosphere or prevents the ocean from absorbing more. And so that is quite nitty gritty hardcore technical science and it involves drills and trawls and all sorts of bits and pieces that Callum can talk to you about. But the end result is this data set. And what, what I think is unique about the Seascape survey versus the other two Stephen did is that baked into this data is a solution. So the Arctic sea ice, it discovered the Arctic sea ice was melting, but there was no way to use that data to change that. This data can change it because this data, and again, it's Blue's job is to take it into the real world and say, okay, thank you for the spreadsheet scientists. Now we're going to turn that into a carbon credit that shows that if you protect X square kilometers of, of coastal shelf, you get Y carbon coming out of it per year. That is a commercially viable unit of carbon. We're then going to enable, for example, Namibia to go out and close its entire ocean to the Chinese fleet so that it doesn't really want there and instead harvest carbon credits. So we're actually going to use the data, I hope, if the results come in the correct way, we hope they're coming, to, to save the sea. Is it likely, and I know you're not the scientist here, but is it likely that through that overfishing and through the trawling, that carbon that has been in our seabed for perhaps hundreds of years, some of it has been released into the atmosphere by the disruption that the, the seabed's undergone? Much more intelligent people than me think that is the case. Yeah. Do they? Yeah. Do they? And by the way, that mud's been there for a long time. That's this is another reason why the ocean is such an important ally for climate change, because a lot of the solutions on land, the drawdown solutions, so the, the planting of forests and things like that, which people sort of got excited about initially, are beginning to be a little bit discredited. There's been some very tough articles about how these forest credits don't perhaps work and you know what happens in the long term when the tree falls over and then somebody cuts it down and burns it because of course you know that's just re-released straight back up into the atmosphere so it's not the sequestering that goes on the earth is not as long term and reliable as what's going on on the seabed you drop mud down to the bottom of the ocean it's not going anywhere unless you trawl it so if we can ban bottom trawling in theory, we can sequester gigatons of carbon down there. When you did the End of the Line documentary, which is 15 years ago now, what were the most shocking findings for you personally, having been somebody, been a diver who's appreciated the ocean and loved it? What did you find it hard to stomach on that journey making the documentary? The charts we put in showing 90% collapses of essentially every large fish on the planet are devastating. I mean, you know, the number of sharks and large pelagic fish that are left have collapsed innumerably. And to read Darwin and to read, well, Professor Callum Roberts' book, The Unnatural History of the Sea, and hear these descriptions of the superabundance that used to be in the ocean, and now the sort of completely collapsed and degraded state of it was really very shocking. And trying to get that across in the film is very important. There's this concept, which I'm sure you've heard of, called shifting baselines. Where, you know, we think, we look around and we think, oh, this is a nice, you know, fertile piece of forest. You know, it's got a deer in it. But 500 years ago, it might have been teeming with life. Now, the ocean is absolutely, that's exactly the point. I think when Darwin arrived at the Galapagos, there's descriptions of them walking ashore on the backs of the turtles. Because there were so many turtles in the bay, they couldn't bring the boats in, but they could walk on them. When the people first settled Canada with the cod, there was such a superabundance of cod, you could put your hand into the sea and pull them out. And now you go out and fish for a day and you're lucky to fill a quarter of the boat. That shifting baselines is what we tried to get across in, in the end of the line, in this sense that everything has collapsed and we really need to act very urgently now. And the other piece in it that I think is very powerful is, is understanding that the reports that were coming in globally of more and more fish are being caught, which is why a lot of people were like, everything's fine in the sea, more and more fish are being caught. In fact, the Chinese were faking their data because they didn't get promoted unless they had good reports every year. So each port manager was saying, oh yes, we caught you know an extra thousand tons of tuna this year. Totally untrue. And when you stripped out that Chinese lie, what you were left with was collapsing wild fisheries. And that was back 20 years ago, they were collapsing and they haven't gotten better since. So despite better boats, bigger radar, you know, more efficient systems of killing, essentially, the wild fish are being hammered relentlessly. And so that's what the end of the line is about.
You said that you took it to, it was seen by the UN, governments, King Charles. What yeah. kind of reaction did you get? And indeed, what kind of reaction did you get from the then Prince Charles? Well, everybody was completely overwhelmed by the news that the ocean was going to run out. And everybody, you know, the intelligent people can almost immediately understand that this is a global resource that needs to be managed for everybody. And also, it's not complicated to understand that if you allow the fish to recover, there'll be more fish to eat. If you take the resource to nothing, it's gone. But if you allow it to regenerate and take a little bit less, then each year you can take more. And so everybody understood immediately what needed to be done. The problem with the ocean is you can't buy it. There's a lot of very successful conservation going on on land led by Americans. Primarily, they buy things and then they protect them. And that's great. You can do that on land. You cannot do that in the sea. If we could buy the sea, we would have fixed this already. You can't buy the sea. Everything we do is government related. It's all about getting governments to protect areas. And that's on the one hand, a lot harder. On the other hand, a lot cheaper because you don't have to buy it. But you do have to convince governments and you do have to show that closing an area to fishing doesn't mean the end of fishing for that area, doesn't mean a loss of income. You know, it all comes back to money. And so you're constantly trying to explain why this is net positive for the environment and the business world, as it were, to protect areas. And that's the battle that Blue's been engaged in and that Lime Bay has been so important in proving. And now as we move into investing in the blue economy, it's also understanding how you can monetize those fisheries and not damage them, you know, how you can make them better. And is this as well where the, the High Seas Treaty and your work alongside the UN comes in to protect, I think it's 30-30 is the current goal, isn't it? 30% of protected areas, protected seas by 2030. Yeah. You're a driving force in that too, aren't you? Well, first of all, that has been a decades-long process led by much bigger and more important people than us. So it's important to say that. But what I will say is when we made the end of the line, 99.8% of the global ocean was fishable. So 0.2% of the ocean was protected. Now we're at 8%. And places like Chagos kick-started that race to create very large marine protected areas. Chagos is larger than the UK. So these areas are massive. So we're trying to get to 30% by 2030. And that's something we're absolutely enmeshed in and, and all over. And we'll only do that with the high seas, which is why the high seas is so important. And we're hoping that we can start to unroll the new MPAs, marine protected areas, in the high seas themselves. And that's kind of watch this space. But the critical part that a lot of people forget about is the other 70%, because you can't just protect 30. You've got to do the other 70% really well, because if we just annihilate everything in the other 70%, the 30% isn't going to save us. And this is the balance. It's 30% protected. 70% managed sustainably. And that's where the investment has to come in. That's where working with fishermen. Blue's great success is we work with fishermen. Very easy to blame them for everything. But actually, they're out there earning a living trying to feed us. And we have to work with them. Do you have an example, George, of a fishing story that's worked really, really well that you're particularly proud of where you've managed to turn something around for a community and inspire them to fish sustainably and see some success through that? Well, Lime Bay is the gold standard for that. But for example, we've created now uh, the largest marine protected area in the Mediterranean, which is an embarrassingly small 500 square kilometers. So I compare that to Chagos, which I think is 650,000 square kilometers. So it goes to show how how behind the Mediterranean is in protection. But we're working there with the local community in Turkey. And brilliantly, they're women. So the women fish, right, which is just absolutely classic as far as I can tell. Men just <laughs> Makes much more sense. I mean, much more sense. Women should do everything, in my opinion, because <laughs> they're so much better than us. So anyway, the women go out and fish. And so we're now supporting them with, again, a route to market to make the fish more valuable because it's about consumers and retailers knowing that the fish is from a sustainable area. So that's beginning. They're beginning to see their incomes tick up. At the same time, because other bigger boats are kept out of the area, there are more fish for them to catch. So the key metric is something called fishing effort. And that is, how long does it take you to go out and fill your boat? And in the old days, it took you two hours. Then three years ago, it probably took you a day. And now as the fish recover, it goes back down to three hours is the ideal. So we're working there in Turkey and it's becoming very successful. The other thing we're doing there is teaching them to catch different fish. So there's a lot of invasive species in the Mediterranean. And these are fish that have come in typically in the bilge tanks of other boats. And so you go to the Red Sea, you pick up some nasty lionfish, 
you bring it to the med and it promptly starts killing everything inside. So lionfish is a huge problem. The other one is the crown of thorns, starfish, which kills everything. So in the Mediterranean, we're trying to get, in Turkey, we're trying to get these fisher women to catch the lionfish. And then we're working with chefs to educate them about how they're, in fact, they're perfectly delicious. I was in Turkey last week and I, my son ate one. I had a small piece, perfectly <laughs> fine. Just another white fish, you know. And so we're trying to transform the economy there as well so they can eat the right type of fish. This work is slow and quite painful, but now that we've had a success in Lime Bay, what we did is we took the Lime Bay fishermen to Turkey and they bring their PowerPoints. And by the way, fishermen are smart. I mean, you know, these are not like sort of people bumbling around. They're running complicated machinery, complicated budgets. You know, they know what they're doing. So they turned up and they made a presentation to the Turkish fisherwomen saying, this is how you do it. This is how you earn more money. This is the benefit of partnering with Blue. And they all signed up. And only fishermen can talk to fishermen, basically. They don't want to hear it from anyone else. But if you've got a, a team of fishermen who believe, then they can communicate with everyone. I'm from Grimsby, so a bit of an old fishwife. So yes. may, maybe I could help out. We're since, trying. Uh, maybe there's a, role in next. There. there's a role in there somewhere. And just tell us a bit more about Lime Bay and the, and the change that you brought about there. It's a very interesting and complicated story. But fundamentally, the fishery was so degraded and it was so destroyed that when we arrived and said, look, shall we try something different? They said, okay, because there was nothing there anymore. And normally fishermen, you know, they don't want to hear from NGOs. I mean, that's the last person they want to listen to. But we somehow managed to connect with them and say to them, look, it's you, you got nothing. Let's try and improve it. And it took 10 years. It took 10 years to build the trust, to build the ocean back. But now with them, you know, they're genuinely making more money, catching less fish because they're worth more, with a clearer route to market, with a long-term, sustainable, profitable future in front of them. Now, the problem with Lime Bay is that word got out, the fish were back. So then a whole bunch of fishermen from another area, and I won't name them who they are because they get upset, steamed in and started fishing in Lime Bay. And this is the tragedy of the commons, right? Because the Lime Bay fishermen don't own Lime Bay. They just happen to be parked there. So that's where they regularly fish. But these other lot who came from somewhere further down the coast came steaming in to take the fish. And so we had a real crisis. And, and it's kind of like in the space of a weekend, they could have destroyed the entire ecosystem because these nets are so big and the damage these boats can do is so rapid that it could have wiped out 10 years progress. So what we managed to do is get an immediate urgent kind of government injunction to turn the voluntary code of conduct in Lime Bay into a legally binding code of conduct, at which point we were able to throw out the other boats because they weren't following that code of conduct. So again, it's all governments. It's complicated stuff. It is complicated stuff. I've been following you for a while on Instagram. One of my favourite parts of the Blue Marine Instagram is when you do, and maybe it's because I'm a journalist, but it's when you do your news updates. And in one post, you see exactly what's going on. So just read you a few little bits and pieces from a post I read the other day. There was the latest news on the High Seas Treaty, which was big news in itself. Panama had expanded its marine protected areas to 54%. There'd been a record 42,513 Atlantic puffins recorded around the Skoma Island in Wales. The resharking project was in the news in Indonesia, putting lots of little baby sharks back in. And also here in Sussex, not very far away from where we're sitting right now, there was news of the kelp forests coming back. I mean, that's a pretty impressive post, George. That's what a week's work. Yeah, that's a week's worth. It's, there's so much going on that's good news. I mean, this is the world's largest solvable problem. People are diving in. We can save the ocean and the ocean can save us. And so all around the world, incredible initiatives are underway because, again, who's against a healthy ocean? There's no upside to being against a healthy ocean. There's nothing, there's nothing to be gained by that. The problem we have are the super large international fleets that are hammering the distant seas that are out of sight, out of mind. So the mega Chinese fleets, the numbers of which are so large, even the Chinese government doesn't know what the numbers are. And second to that, the EU fleet, which I have to say is very bad, which is out in the Indian Ocean, totally overfishing the yellowfin tuna. So the problem is all the small stuff we do along the edges is great and is helping, but we need to tackle the big fleets as well. And that is about stopping bottom trawling and cutting subsidies. 
And so a very important piece of work is to basically turn the economic model on its head. Why is it that we're paying fishermen to destroy the resource? You know, this is just wrong. What we should be doing is paying countries to regenerate the sea, which is the carbon credit model. And that's the way it is. Yeah. Can people make countries like China listen? China's obviously a massive player. I think we're going to have to do it despite China. Yeah. But I have heard there's some very interesting data that I know a great scientist called Alan Pickage who told me the other day that China has a lot more MPAs than anybody has any idea of. And I think they're already at something like, and forgive me if I get this wrong, but they're definitely over 12% of their waters protected. Now, this is a classic kind of <laughs> a classic situation. A country can say it's doing really well, I've protected its waters, but that means nothing if their fleets are over on the other side of the world trampling everybody else's waters. So there is a big problem there. But the only way we can address it is persistent, hard work, create our own marine protected areas. Let's at least start with the countries that are listening and then let's expand it and let's bring everybody in. Tell me a bit about Ocean 14, because I know you're involved in helping yeah. the United Nations solve their sustainable development goal 14, life below water. So I love the name Ocean 14. Yeah, um, original, when I was right? busy, Yeah, when I was busy Googling it, I kept putting the S on and learning yeah, yeah. all about them. The, so the another movie film with or something, George, another, with Brad Pitt. Another movie. I thought, I, I know Brad that George. That, I didn't know group. George was starring in that particular movie. Yeah. But tell me about Ocean 14 and how you explain that to investors, because that sounds a really exciting project to me. Well, so Oceans 14 is separate from Blue, but really represents the other side of the coin. So Blue is a charity. We're not that interested in building financial models, although, as I've just explained, everything we're doing is leading to a financial model, ironically. But Ocean 14 is a private equity growth fund. So we set this up and we've raised 130 something million and we're heading to 180, 200 million. We've set this up to invest in the Blue economy because there are so many companies out there that require money to do it right, to grow, to feed the planet, to, to, to basically harness the ocean's power to feed us and regenerate, that we couldn't do it with charity alone. So Ocean 14 fills this massive gap between a lot of venture startup funding. There's a lot of people doing apps for the ocean. Like, you know, this app is going to save the sea. I'm not sure it is. I don't think apps can save the sea. On the other hand, you've got giant conglomerates running huge businesses. Okay, fine. In the middle is hundreds of billions of dollars worth of companies and nobody's investing in them. And they're all just bumbling along and failing and going bust or some are growing. Many of them fail because there is no reliable source of growth equity. So we set up Ocean 14, there's four of us in that partnership, and we're flat out investing in food security and marine ecosystems. So that means aquaculture done right, because fish farming can be done right. And actually the great mistake in sea spiracy is it said you can't do fish farming right. And that's totally incorrect. Not only can we do fish farming right, but we actually have to because it's going to feed the world on a much lower carbon footprint than, than animal protein on land. We're doing alternatives to fish protein because the biggest problem with aquaculture is that you catch wild fish to feed the fish in the pens. So what we need to do is break that and we need to stop catching wild fish to feed the farm fish. We need to feed the farm fish alternatives. And that's going on all over the world, insects, algae, stuff like that. And then the last one is to invest in sustainable fisheries, which is actually very hard, which is to invest in fishing fleets, doing the right thing, to invest in data around that actually is the right investment thesis. So looking at tracking fishing vessels so they behave, changing the gear they use, sort of technology plays around fishing. And then the other piece, marine ecosystems, which is plastic, keeping plastic out of the sea, and then seaweed which is an extraordinary investment opportunity, albeit one that's quite complicated to get right, let's put it that way. So the whole point of Ocean 14 is we believe in the convergence of drivers. So there's a sustainability push and there's a making money finance push. And in the ocean, only businesses that do good will do well, right? You can't build a fishing company that is designed to fish all the fish out. You're going to go bust. There's no longevity to that. So the good fish farms are the ones that are moving away from wild fish, that are not polluting, that are not going to be shut down by regulators, that are going to get enhanced premiums in the retailer because it's a good product. So you invest in businesses that make money and do good at the same time. And is that what you meant right at the beginning when we were talking about how you describe yourself and you said a marine conservationist with two hats on. Yes. So the two hats is charity and, and finance and charity and business. And it's great because, you know, I go to dinner with somebody 
And if they want to give money to charity, I've got it. I'm ready. And if they want to invest, I'm ready. <laughs> so I just, I have, I have my two hats and I just change hats at dinner, depending on who I'm sitting next to. And you partnered in Blue Marine with Charles Clover. I'm just looking at his book, which you've kindly given me there, Rewilding the Sea. Has he brought very different qualities to Blue? Definitely. And the success of Blue is because we're not marine scientists. You know, there are a lot of marine scientists sitting in NGOs and they're not doing a lot. We're sort of after the action. We're after the results. So Charles is a journalist and an author and I'm a filmmaker. And my other partner, Chris Goral Barnes, is a, was a media advertising kind of entrepreneur. So we just like get stuff done and just push and ask. And Charles has this wonderful ability of scaring governments into action, you know. And so we, we would go to the foreign office and we'll say, listen, we can help you. We can replace the money from the fisheries income and let's protect this wonderful area and let's make it a, the best marine protected area in the Atlantic. Or we can do a front page article in the Sunday Times about how you're allowing slave fleets catching sharks in it. And they kind of look at us and they go, Okay, <laughs> and it works, right? So it's carrot and stick. So it's just getting it done. Getting it done. And getting it done leads me nicely on. I hope you don't mind me mentioning your mum. Oh, your, yeah. Your mum, Dame Vivian Claw. I've not met her. I'd be quite scared, I think, of meeting her because I think she would gets things done, doesn't she? And I've read interviews with her where she said to the interviewer, I don't like this. I don't like being interviewed. Is that where some of your drive and spirit comes from? Because she's an extraordinary lady, isn't she, your mum? Yep. She takes no prisoners. Um, <laughs> well, look, I mean, I've got two parents and my dad is equally impressive. So, you know, he's been very successful in the business world and my mother has been a powerhouse in the charitable world. So I think I'm just channeling both of their spirits, actually. And did they give you a love of the diving and the sea no, as well? No, not at all. Up, no, zero, at all? zero, no. zero, zero. No, I think it was because yeah, it's one of those things you do because your parents don't probably. <laughs> Yeah. And in fact, it's taken me a long time to talk them into caring about the ocean. And I'm not even sure they do. Really? It's a generation that doesn't feel the planetary crisis. Yeah. You know, it's not their crisis. It's not even our crisis. It's our children's crisis and their children's mega crisis. But it's a good job then that there are people like you and, and Blue Marine and Stephen Catlin and Convex and Exeter Marine you, marine biologists actually getting up and doing anything when you lie in bed at night, George, do you think this is salvageable and that yes. enough people are doing enough to try and reverse it? Yes, this is, this is the crisis in the ocean is the world's largest solvable problem. We can fix the crisis in the ocean. And if we fix the ocean's health and allow it to regenerate, then that will play the decisive role in stopping runaway global warming. Conversely, if we lose the ocean, then I think we have almost no chance of stopping runaway global warming. But because of the convergence of factors in the sea, this notion that a sea managed for carbon is a healthier sea, that more people can earn livelihoods on, that more people can feed on, right? This positivity that happens in all directions at the same time in the ocean, or rather one direction, the right direction, I think we can fix it. I really do. This is the world's largest solvable problem. And the levers that Callum referred to in your conversation with him are immensely long. So if we can unlock in the next four or five years carbon credits in the ocean and the sea recovers so quickly, right? Five years, you can go from nothing to really healthy ocean. Some fish take longer, but basically five years is enough to see a big difference. That's what's happening in Sussex, by the way. Been closed for 18 months and already there are like dolphins and rays that people haven't seen for two decades. So it bounces back the sea. So I think if we start doing this now, then within two, three decades, the difference could be absolutely exponential. And it's so big, the sea, that its ability to affect the atmosphere is immense. I mean, that's just the whole point. If we do, if we ban bottom trawling globally, it could have an absolutely transformational effect on, on global warming. We started this conversation with you scuba diving and talking about some of the beautiful sights you'd seen underwater and also touched slightly on your wildlife photography. Can we end, indulge me with what are the most spectacular things you've ever seen under the water? I don't scuba dive. It's now going top of the list to do it because I think there's a whole world out there that I've never seen. I'm definitely a sucker for the big stuff. 
Underwater photographers split into two, people who like big stuff, uh, who, you know, the, and the other lot sneer at us, and they're the macro guys. And oh, see, like I'd, the like little, the big, I'd like the, the big fiddly. stuff. Yeah, well, I'd the like big, the big stuff. Big stuff's Tell me about exciting. the big stuff. So the answer is going diving in the Galapagos and Darwin's Arch, which is this incredible rock formation that sadly fell down, which is quite sort of odd. Uh, well, erosion, not odd, but it was sad it happened. It fell down a couple of years ago. And that is one of the mythical gathering places of whale sharks. So on a single dive there, I saw, you know, four or five really big whale sharks amongst hundreds of hammerheads. So you're in the sea with very strong current and you're tied onto a cliff because the current's pushing you so strongly away. And these whale sharks just cruise past and then hundreds of hammerheads around them. And you're like, oh my God, it's swimming with dinosaurs. I mean, it's the most extraordinary experience. And then the other one is diving under the ice in Antarctica, where I went with Ollie and Susie. And we dive down with leopard seal. And leopard seal, you know, they're the baddie in um, um, Ice Age or whatever yeah, it is. Ice Age. Anyway, they're the baddies and they are enormous and they fulfill the function of the polar bear in the Southern Hemisphere. So there's no polar bear in Antarctica. There is instead the leopard seal and they are top predators. Their heads are bigger than, than your head and it can take your whole head in its mouth. And they are incredibly playful. And so this leopard seal just kept coming closer and closer and closer and everybody else got out of the water <laughs> and it was right with me. And the last picture I took on the last dive in Antarctica was of this leopard seal right next to me. And that was a good photo. And I won the Natural History Museum's underwater category, Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award with that photo. And then the next pass, it came round and bit my fin. <laughs> At which point I... All I remember was one minute I was in the water with this leopard seal biting my fin. And the next moment I was standing on the boat deck, like 50 yards away in a dry suit, carrying my tank. And I don't have any recollection of how I got from there to there. But I can tell you, adrenaline does extraordinary things when you need it to. Wow. I just flew out of the water. That's extraordinary. That's been fantastic talking to you. I, I feel like we've just kind of just scratched the surface and there feels like there's probably a part two in this somewhere. I know we're doing work together with Convex, which well, is great. I, I'd, and, I'd love to talk to you again. And, uh, and I think it'd be great to go into more detail, but you've given a really fantastic view of what's going on. And do keep going with Blue Marine because... I know you said at the beginning, it's not easy with a charity. It's not easy, but it sounds like you're making some real difference. Yeah. And I'm excited to see what the Convex Seascape survey turns up as well. I think it that'll could, be really it could, exciting. Um, well, it, the best part of it is it could put me out of a job. Because oh. if we get it right, if it comes good, the Convex Seascape survey, then, then marine conservation will pay for itself. And I no longer need to, to be involved in a charity that, that asks for money because everybody will be doing marine protection as a business. So more scuba diving and more less diving. work for you. Exactly. Yeah, you really. have been listening to marine conservationist George Duffield, co-founder of Blue Marine Foundation and a partner in the Convex Seascape Survey, along with some of the finest marine biologists from Exeter University. Don't forget to subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to yours. Join me next week when I'll be experiencing and giving a glimpse into the future of sustainable aviation. See you then.